swear too much, so maybe I'll try not to do that, or maybe I will anyway. Um, so, um, I suppose I should be talking into this, because otherwise that can't hear me. So, what I said just now it was really funny, <laughs> <laughs> um, because they were just having to hold it in, otherwise they wouldn't have much to do. Uh, so, that's where it goes in the trouble. And they just did. Uh, so I thought I'd come and talk about microservices again. I think I've talked about microservices a couple of times here. Um, oh, by the way, while I get uh, annoyed by these books that are here, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk here. And thank you to Moo. Uh, and this meetup is just awesome. It's been going for a long time. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? So I thought we'd um, just talk about microservices. What I was really hoping to do was sit here and do a specific live coding thing. I didn't want to show you some code and try and make something work, but I am kind of frightened of that because it's kind of weird and uh, it hasn't turned out the way I wanted it to. So I thought I'd give you an overview first of where currently my thinking is, the people that I know um, who are trying to move all of this, I work in a great big bank, and um, it's all the things that great big banks are. Um, so, microservices. I've been around them, I guess, for uh, uh, five or so years, I suppose. Uh, I suppose I've always been trying to do it that way. Um, there was a guy at the I worked with who was crystallizing all this change to this. He came up with the idea of, or at least I think he crystallized that word, microservices. He talked about them as being. Um, like, like Unix things, like they're really small. Um, but small is a matter of perspective. So the benefits that people tout about microservices are, do you love my uh, fantastic presentation tool? Well, it's very expensive. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, the fonts cost me uh, <laughs> on their own. Um, it's very difficult to get this level of artisanal quality <laughs> in your hands. Um, so I had them specially made for me in Mexico. <laughs> um, so the benefits are touted as that it's, uh, it's logical, it makes sense, it all fits together, this idea. Um, it's coherent and it's explainable. Um, one of, that might sound intangible, but actually when you're trying to change things, that is a valuable property. Um, so if you're in an organization that is needing to get better at what it does so that it can deliver more value to customers, one of the ways that it is necessary to go and change the IT, and it's very difficult to explain how to change IT, and so if you've got something that is logical and coherent and explainable, that's valuable property. Um, but another more tangible thing maybe is that microservices are easier to get value from clouds. Uh, they are more cloud economically friendly. Uh, so the smaller the thing is, the more you can parcel it up, the more you can divide the CPU time. Uh, that's basically it. Right? Uh, now, lots of things are maybe not so cloud economically friendly. Uh, they're easy to scale organizationally. Uh, uh, what does that mean? What I mean is it's easy to get going. Um, once you've got going, it's easy to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You, to start, you don't need any of those things that I've drawn a line through, which um, are K8s and Kubernetes and HashiCorp and Vault and Istio and you know, a million buzzwords uh, that we might buy. Uh, those things might all be really, really valuable at scale. You could scale in all sorts of ways. If you've got granularity, you can, you can do things. If you haven't, you're restricted in some ways. It might still be valuable, but 
it's maybe not so easy to do. <coughs> what are the problems? Well, how small is small? Um, so that looks nothing like James Lewis, that picture of the head of the ruler bike. When people used to say to James, how small is a microservice? He used to go like this, he used to go, it's about as big as my head. <laughs> uh, which was a fucking useless answer to me. Um, and he knew it. It's a bastard. Um, but I guess what he meant was, it fits inside your head, right? You can, you can have the piece of code, uh, this contiguous service thing, and it fits inside your head. You can understand it. You can understand it quickly. I think that's what he meant. Uh, not literally that the code was about seven inches long. Um, but maybe. It depends how big the font is, doesn't it? Uh, so, one of the other problems, though, is imagination. Uh, this how small is small, people really struggle with. It's not concrete. And one of the things I realized just recently, I don't know, maybe I'm going to get shouted down about this. And please, if you do have a question, just shout, I guess. Um, I don't think we're very imaginative as a culture. Um, and I know that I'm not very imaginative personally. But literally, I cannot imagine big things. Uh, so I, I can do that, right? I cannot draw a cathedral to scale in any way whatsoever. I can't imagine it. Maybe we're not very imaginative. I know that, so the reason I do these two people is because if you ask a group of developers to go to a fancy dress party, um, in the most imaginative way probably, they'll, all, they'll say, I'm going to go as a wizard. That's very imaginative. No. Um, that is a problem. So when you're trying to change things and persuade people to do things differently, and you've got ambiguity, like how small is the microservice? People really struggle with it. So I, we're, we're about, what, five years in to doing this, and lots of people would have done it, I'm sure. Who's been around microservices in their work? Put your hands up. Right, it, nearly everybody, right? So um, this is a repeated thing. Lots of the teams I go to where I work and where I've worked previously and explain this concept, even if they're enthusiastic about it, you go back three months later and what they've made is 10,000 lines of code and they're calling it a microservice. And it's like, um, maybe it's not micro, 10,000 lines of code. So, you know, it's very difficult to cope with this ambiguity. Um, so let's talk concrete problems though. And all of these problems are expressed in the tiny bit of code, but well, it's not actually that tiny, uh, but the smallish piece of code that I've got that I would like to run you through and try and make a change, maybe. Um, secrets, keeping secrets. So if you're talking about services, it's really easy to make microservices if you throw away all the problems of real life. Right? If you just have a piece of code talking to another piece of code, that's easy, right? You could do that in 20 lines of JavaScript or Python or Java, or, well, maybe not Java, maybe 2,000 lines of Java. <laughs> um, but, you know, 20 lines of anything reasonable. Um, but secret keeping is a real thing, you're going to need to do it. If you're making all these services, suddenly you've exponentially increased the number of APIs that you've got because they all need to talk to each other, and now that's a lot more secrets you need to keep. Oh, shit. Um, how are we going to deal with that? So uh, we, where I work, have come up with an answer to that. So there are lots of answers, by the way. There's a, uh, a tool called HashiCorp, or, or a vault from HashiCorp, um, and it's super duper. Um, but I don't like buying things from people, partly because I've never got any money, because I work at a massive bank. <laughs> um, wait. Um, and partly because I just don't, I don't like sales and all of that. I don't like it. Um, so I am the original, when they coined the term, not invented here, they were thinking of me. Uh, I probably just talked to them. Um, so I like making things, so let's go and make things. So Keepy is my answer, our answer to this problem. Uh, Keepy is just a protocol for exchanging secrets. So you can just implement it as a program, or you can just implement it in whatever way you like. Um, 
Can I take a step back right here? It just reminds me. Who writes code every day? How many of you like don't ever write code, like from week to week? Anybody want to write? Cool. I'm not being exclusive about this, but one of the things that I worry about in DevOps, to me it was supposed to be about <coughs> devs doing ops things, like making it work, building systems, and somebody in the front row is laughing. And I think that's spot on, right? I'm worried about this culture, this, this community at this juncture. I don't want to hit on anyone who doesn't code, um, and I meet just as many devs who aren't interested in ops. And it really, that isn't what it was about. And I feel like we failed at some point. Maybe we had to persevere, but it worries me. So that's one of the reasons I make shit. Um, so keep is a good answer to this. You can exchange secrets, it's very safe. I can explain, does anyone want me to go into the detail? Yeah, go on. Okay, so uh, <laughs> oh, in Keepy, you have two, so you, you've got a, a, a secret leader, the SN, and a secret keeper. So a uh, secret keeper will presumably be the thing that you're talking to, but it also owns the secret, right? Now the secret could have been generated randomly, um, it, or it might be an Oracle database that's passed by. Who knows? But it's a secret. So what you do is you make you have two endpoints. The secret keeper needs an endpoint, and the secret needer needs an endpoint to receive the secret. And when it wants the secret, the secret needer can send to the secret keeper and say, hey, I'd like the secret. And the secret keeper can go, okay, thanks. And then it can examine what the secret sender sent it, the secret needer sent it. And it has the secret needer has to send it its location. I am at you know, HTTP, blah, 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 colon, or slash, whatever. And the secret keeper can then examine that URL and say, is this a URL is authorized to receive the secret? And if it is, I'll make an HTTP call to that location and send it the secret. That is perfectly safe. It doesn't solve every problem, but it does solve the problem of distribution of secrets. And if you do things that way, it tends to push you towards generating the passwords, generating the secrets randomly, and never storing them anywhere, and just making them ephemeral. And one of the things I've noticed is that the more ephemeral things are, the easier it is to manage, and the safer things are, and the more resilient they are. So if you're throwing things away, or deliberately making something that is never saved, that's normally a good sign. So Keepy is there to make that happen. It's very difficult then when you do get that, like a concrete secret, like, the, where I work with them, lots of big fixed Oracle databases where there's a person who knows the password or three people who know the password. And that is very, very difficult because now you've got to put it in this source code somehow or have them type it in every time they keep themselves. Anyway, there you go. That's one way to do it. Uh, problem number two, databases. This is probably the biggest problem in microservices or the thing that causes the most problems. Um, you have two things that you need to store. You've got users and tweets, just as an example. Um, users are created through registration and through login and uh, through edit of my profile and that kind of stuff. And tweets, are, so they're created every now and again. If you're lucky, they're created a lot. Um, tweets are created much more often, probably looked at less um, on a you know, single basis. Uh, but there's a lot more of them. They are tied, though, to the user information. When you display the tweet, you want to display the user's photo, the name, all sorts of information about the user, and you want to get that quickly. So ideally, you'd have a SQL query or something, whatever database engine you happen to be using, that can access both of those pieces of information. Well, now they're tied into the same database. And so that doesn't feel like it's very microservice-y anymore. So are there answers to that? Uh, well, yes there are. So I tried to, uh, try to solve this problem at work for about four years. And uh, so I finally came up with something that worked. So I decided I would call it the most pompous name <laughs> I could invent. So uh, I sat for quite a while trying to work out all the letters of the Greek alphabet that had or had not been used for incredibly pompous architectural styles and I settled on Epsilon. Um, so now, 
it's really funny because I've got loads of people wandering around at work going, well, we should solve this problem with the Epsilon architecture. <laughs> Completely straight face. <laughs> you know, it's wonderful when you sit in a meeting and somebody says, well, how about Epsilon for this? And you get to go. <laughs> um, we'll cut that bit out of the video, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the idea of the Epsilon architecture is really old, don't tell anyone, but it's actually just a well worn pattern that we've been doing for years and years and years. Just move data around with events. The thing is, when we invented this, and again, we're such a weird group of people, IT people, so everybody goes, oh yeah, events, that's a good way of doing things. Let's go off and invent whole massive new technologies just to move events around out of your database. Or what we could do is add events into databases. Oh no, no one will buy that. Let's not, no, 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 let's go and make new things. Uh, let's go and make AMQ, let's go and make, you know, MQ, let's go and charge customers millions and millions of pounds and dollars. Um, so what we do instead is event our databases, use triggers to fire events outside of the database that you can consume with, these days, you can consume it with web protocols. So just emit them as SSE events or something like that, and then consume them. It's not perfect, but it works really well. You normally have to combine it with windowing of some type to say, oh, my SSE stream dropped and I'm not getting the events anymore, so I'll have to go and window. And even for the most delicate, uh, like sensitive situations like trades and stuff like that, it's normally okay to do things that way. Um, so then, if you've got that kind of stuff going on, then you can combine them into databases where you can do specialized queries against those databases. So you can have lots of heavily partitioned data and then combine it for the purposes of doing query. And it can be up to date. You don't have to be hitting all the databases with batching. So that's the most pompous architecture that's ever been. Problem number three is Disco. Who likes Disco? Uh, discovery, I mean, really, but it was too good an opportunity to miss a poor, stupid picture. Um, when I was doing this last night, my wife looked at me and she said, doing your homework at the last minute, are you? Uh, so there we are. Um, discovery, what do I mean by discovery? I mean, it's now, you've, again, you've made it worse. It would be better, wouldn't it, just to have one thing, and then we know where it is. But microservices are lots of things. You're going to have lots of things. Um, one of the products I'm involved with, uh, where I work, we've got 7,000 things on production. Like, there's 100 boxes, but there's 7,000 distinct things. Like, those are different services. Wow. Um, so, finding out where they all are, and by the way, we don't really use any kind of um, dynamic discovery mechanism. It's all pretty static. Um, so, Finding out where those things are and uh, keeping track of them and knowing that it's moved from that box to that box and that box to that box is a pretty difficult problem. And another problem you've got to solve. The way we solve it is with this tool called Franco, which is basically just a reverse proxy, but like really a reverse proxy. When you go to look at reverse proxies, they're not very reverse. Um, what we do, and I've tried to draw it here, and it's a really shit picture, sorry about that. Um, the reason that these are uh, fat like from here to here, is because that's a WebSocket. So what we do, we fire up a new service, it connects a WebSocket to the router, this is a router. This is good, isn't it? Gosh, I'm doing a whole new presentation now. <laughs> um, and then the traffic coming in gets routed back over the WebSocket to this server here. So it's just HTTP requests, and we're just tunneling them back. Now, the really cool thing about that and I'm told, that I haven't really looked at Istio, but I'm told it's like Istio. We were dead first, um, which is annoying. Um, the really cool thing about it is you can just stand these services up. So you don't need to say, oh, it's going to be here, or restart the load balancer, or anything like that. It just load balances, it just works. <coughs> so it's pretty cool, it's pretty neat. Why does that work for discovery? Because you can fix, because these things, you can have fewer of. So they're not monoliths, but you can have a few. A manageable number. All the lights have gone off just behind me. This is very attractive area, by the way. Later it could find it. Um, I'm enjoying this area. 
And, and these are very effectively coloured as well. You probably can't see that on the camera. Um, so actually, if you were a mantis shrimp, you'd be able to fully uh, appreciate the benefit of those. Um, so, how I can't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> Something like this. Uh, anyway, so this service discovery. It's a good call. So why, yeah, why does this work for service discovery? Because you can have fewer of these, so you can have one for that API and one for that API, and it's just less things to worry about. So you probably haven't got thousands and thousands and thousands of um, these collected hubs of information. You've probably maybe got tens, and that's unmanageable. Maybe if you try to organize an entire company, like the size of my bank or something like that, if you tried to do it flat, that would be kind of a problem. But almost no one has to do that. Um, OK, so moving rapidly on. Problem number four, reuse. Uh, common mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> the data service. So we talked about data, databases. Um, every, I think every time I've seen people try to do microservices, um, someone goes, oh, we've got a database here, so let's have a service that does like the data. And then everyone connects to that. That isn't the point of it. Uh, that isn't the point. You're just making a single point of failure that you'll have to distribute, just as if you might as well have everything talk to the database. Because the data service is just going to end up with the same thing. Nearly everybody does it. And they find, if you challenge them on it, they find increasingly entertaining ways to deny that they've done it. So if you happen to be around these sorts of projects, uh, it's always fun to go for that to data service, that's a single point of failure, and watch the architects go, no, it isn't for these reasons, and uh, just keep going until you get bored, uh, or they get so close that they get not to. Um, this, uh, this was supposed to be one of those really scary, is anybody really weirded out by those, gives me they give me the wiggins, those doctors from the Middle Ages with the enormous feet. <laughs> they have really big noses. Um, Plague doctors. I guess they thought, oh yes, they packed stuff in the nose, and they thought well, that would stop them getting the plague. Um, he didn't. Uh, let's make a framework so it's easier to do microservices. The first do no harm principle of medicine, although doctors barely practice it, let's face it, uh, but the first do no harm would be something that we should all really take the heart. So if somebody sits there and they go, I've just discovered microservices, the first thing I'm going to do is make a framework for everyone else who hasn't discovered microservices yet, because I'm enlightened having spent the day uh, on it. Um, maybe if you had this principle of first do no harm, maybe that would give you pause. Um, but then humans being what they are, probably not. Um, so, X is a problem, let's centralize, seems to be, I mean, maybe that's just not a <coughs> microservice thing, but people go, yeah, 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 this is all microservices, and then you go and look, and you go, but there's a centralized thing, and there's a centralized thing, and they go, yeah, yeah, it's a bit like the testing thing. You programmers talk about doing testing, and then they go, oh yeah, but this can't really be tested. Like all the time, if you notice that, like I do it when I'm coding, it's like, yeah, oh, well, like, you can't really test it. But, and you, of course you can, you can test anything. Uh, and so, decentralizing things is almost always possible. Why do we ever centralize? I mean, I guess if you're going to say we couldn't work out how to centralize it, how to decentralize it, that's okay. But if you're just doing it because you're lazy, maybe that's okay. So, fat. Uh, this is my favorite slide of all, I think. I, I spent like minutes. <laughs> um, okay, so what I would like to do, ooh, sorry, uh, this Emacs is running in WSL, and um, it's a bit weird. So 
So if I can, I want to take you through making a small change. Someone described me once as London's leading Emacs pro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you make the font bigger? Can I make the font bigger? Well, let's see. Makes <laughs> 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 it very small. We can walk small. Um, I probably can make the font bigger, but I can't remember what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> this is, my apologies, this is a fairly new computer, right? And it hasn't been fully Emacs customized. <laughs> 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 Uh, I probably can't. Oh, look, frame, bomb, bigger. It's as easy as that. <laughs> now I've made it disappear. Again. <laughs> That's Windows' fault, though. To be fair, uh, I'm, this is totally weird, right? I didn't use Windows for twenty years, and now I'm using Windows. Poor uh, soul. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said you poor soul. Oh, I'm enjoying it. Really? I'm enjoying it. So, like, I'm using WSL. Uh, it works. I don't know. Yeah, so I don't need Git Bash. I don't get on the Git Bash, so that's that much. Uh, so, anyway, so what I tried to do beginning of this year, I thought, look, the problem with reuse, it was that little, did you notice that little gag? How am I doing for time? Okay, so this 20, 30, 30 years. The problem with reuse is people aren't making things small enough. They don't really make things small enough. Um, so you get like, um, oh, this, here's this service and it does registration or it holds users, so it's got a database and it, and it offers the registration, and it offers the registration, and you're like, it's still too big. We could cut things down to the next layer. It does feel like we'll need framework to do that because. So I'm breaking all my rules. I'm just you know, like all humans. Here's some advice that I don't follow. <laughs> um, so I've been trying to build uh, a ticketing system because I've got my own Jira to work and I hate Jira. <laughs> uh, so I've been trying to build a ticketing system this way, like really, really small. So um, I thought you'd have like a microservice around, um, and so the more microservices you've got, the more authentication problems you've got, you've got to store all those secrets, so I've been trying to do all of that the right way, all of it, like proper uh, looking after the concerns, and not trying to bake in too much technology, you know, concrete decisions. So if you wanted to do all of this on top of the cube or whatever, you should be able to do it. Um, I, I'm pretty much paid, I have to admit. So um, there's a, uh, an issue service which uh, looks after, well, maybe I should explain uh, this. If you turn a database into just a log, then it becomes easy to replicate the database. The trouble is, all you've got is a log. So logs aren't so terribly useful when you want to do complex queries like let's query all the users, or let's query all the users who um, have a surname that begins with D, or whatever. Um, so that kind of gets difficult. But if you could normalize the log functionally, like okay, so here's how the log gets denormalized into you know or normalized into proper tables, and then if you stood up a new database scraping the log then you could just do the same thing, right? You could just replay that functional transformation. So maybe it would maybe be okay. So I restricted the nature of update in this thing to only log. So all you can do is uh, insert another entry into a log, but as the programmer, you can define a bunch of tables and you can define how, how they will be um, normalized. So this is a trigger, basically sits on a table, on a log table, and turns into a bunch of other tables which you can then present. So I've got lots of, or two right now, um, little uh, services, one's users and one's issues. And maybe that's all we need, maybe I need attachments. Like one of the things that you need to do in a ticketing system is upload a photo of the mesh your desktop is, or whatever the web app looks like. 
Uh, so I'll probably need to do that separately. And again, doing that through a log, that feels a bit weird, but I, I stick to the religion and see if it works. Um, and then you need some sort of service to orchestrate all of that. So let me just take you through it quickly. This is Node. Anybody uh, really, really hate looking at Node? So much that you're physically going to run from the room right now. No one actually has, so that seems okay, doesn't it? Um, so we've got, a, we've got a login thing that is uh, simple. Uh, and we've got, so we've got a post somewhere, which is, there we go, posting an issue. Uh, is pretty simple. Turn it into a log, make an HTTP request to upload it to the other service which is acting as the issue store. Uh, because they is automatically denormalized, these kind of handlers are presenting views of that log that are just done in the SQL database. So it's just, it's just Postmix. Uh, everything is stood up completely automatically, all random generated passwords and all of that. So, what I'm trying to say is, maybe we've got the beginnings here, for us at least, of a reuse example. Uh, so we could take our user service, we have a whole bunch of places where we need that to happen, and we could roll that out over and over and over and over again, because it's so simple and generic. It really is, because all it is, is the details about a user. And it's a log, so you can put whatever in it you like, and then denormalize it in whatever way. It's pretty simple. So, I haven't really got to the point of live coding, but I probably am out of time. So, um, rather than risk running it, maybe I should show you though. Let's do it. Let's at least show you that it works. It's very slow, it's the other thing, right? If you're working on a whole bunch of microservices at the same time, you want to stand them up all together. Uh, which means startup times are slow, or at least slower. Gosh, that is. Sometimes Windows is immense. <laughs> <laughs> Final system on Windows is terrible. Okay, now let me hit. So, what's the message of this talk? Why am I, why am I talking to you? <coughs> I'm talking to you because I think at this juncture we've got a real problem. Some of us are becoming plumbers, and some of us are moving back into just pure devs. And that wasn't the point. The point was to look after these systems and make them grow well, safely. And the way to do that is granularity. The way to do that, maybe, is to think of, is to decompose the thing more. Now, microservices are one way to do that, and I don't think they have all the answers. Hopefully, I've given you a flavor of what the problems are, and to show you that many of us, of us are still committed to trying to fix those problems. The are still problems, we're trying to fix them. Um, but it feels like DevOps and microservices go together, to me, and in glove. Now, if they don't, that's cool. But um, we have to find another answer for working together to solve problems on systems, if that's not true. Thank you very much for letting me talk to you. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. I've got a pistol on. It doesn't seem to be. It doesn't. Okay. I'm going to have this to, to Andrew. Maybe not. <laughs> Mr. Hardy. Nick, thanks. Um, I had the privilege of working with you at the large bank, which shall not be named, where I learned a few things, but only from you. I then, <laughs> I then went off to work for another large bank, which shall not be named, where I got into a super hot argument about what constitutes a microservice. And I realized the reason that people don't understand microservices is because they think the word micro applied to the service, which is just wrong. The whole point about decomposing a monolith is to turn it into pieces that you can tweak individually. So my new definition of a microservice is a service that can be micro-adjusted. 
If you've got a part of a monolith that's not working well enough, you can only scale the whole monolith. If you decompose that in the microservices, you can scale each service component separately. You can scale it, you can optimize it. It's micro adjustable. It doesn't have to be micro in size. It can be a two meg go binary, or it can be a massive thing with umpteen entry points and millions of lines of code is not the point. The point is you can individually adjust its performance and presentation. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> That's the open floor session. I think we should pick, pick that up um, later on because there's a lot of stuff in there and really good to explore that. Um, anyone got a more direct question at all before we move on? Yes, if you're there, I'm going to throw it in the end. I don't know. Isn't introducing WebSockets actually adding more complexity as, if I recall, it, it actually lives in a pretty high network layer? And don't you consider that having seven, like, X thousand of them actually impairing their performance when it goes for network? I can't talk on that. So, do you want me to just talk? This is hilarious, isn't it? <laughs> Message passing. Uh, we need locks. Um, <laughs> it's a really good question. Uh, the, can I tell you a story in answer? So when we came up with Cranker, because that's what we're talking about, right? Um, I happened, so Matt and Mark and I worked on data and stuff, and uh, so we, I know the guy from Tinder who runs networks and their web servers for Tinder, right? Oh, well. Um, <laughs> and when I explained Cranker to him, he said, that's outrageous. How dare you waste file descriptors like that? <laughs> uh, and I said, well, I don't really have your problem. I've got 10,000 users. I don't have 10,000 users a microsecond. Like, you know, they have scale problems, real scale problems. I don't. Um, so you're probably right that it's shit in some situations, but it's not shit for us. Our problem is more organizationally, how to scale things up and down, how to experiment, um, all of those kind of things. But what the network performance is to us, it's, it probably isn't the most performant thing we could do, but it's good enough. We don't notice that isn't our biggest problem. Well, we have many other problems before that. <laughs> So, and it feels like it's very flexible. So it feels like before optimization is your problem, before that is your problem, it's pretty cool. Okay? Thanks, Nick. There was one more question somewhere that was. Hi, Nick. Uh, simple question. Your secret keeper, how does it trust the secret meter? It's really simple. <laughs> it's very clear that I did a very bad job of explaining it. Um, the secret meter, it has got an endpoint that it's going to receive the secret on. So, the secret keeper knows what that endpoint is. You pre-told it what that endpoint should be. So if something turns up and says, hey, I'd like to send me the secret on HTTP, blah, 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 colon 8000, slash, I'm stealing your secret. And it isn't in the pre-arranged list of places to send the secret to, then the secret keeper doesn't send it. So it might say, okay. Um, but it's not going to send a secret office. So, Go on. So how do you maintain this list of the... So the, the, question, the follow-up question is, how do we maintain the list? Pull requests. So one of, the, one of the principles of this thing is know your consumers. So it's not just a dynamic authentication system. You have to know who your consumer is. But that seems like it's okay in most situations. Like you've got this consumer of the service, it knows it wants to consume that service over here. The service that is being consumed should probably know that it's being consumed by that thing. Otherwise, you've got all sorts of discovery problems. 
Like, if it knows, it can publish it, you can make it discoverable, all of those things. I'm sure there are other ways of doing it, right? But it is a very, very difficult problem to solve, how to manage secrets, pass them around safely, and not get in a terrible mess. So this is one way, and it also solves the kind of know your consumer problem, which is important too. Does that make sense? <coughs> but there's another question. How Oh, just a short one, go ahead. <laughs> so, doesn't that actually make your either DHCP server or DNS server a third, part, a third party that actually you authenticate against? And what about DNS spoofing? What about encrypting DNS or other resolve protocols? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the interesting things is you're absolutely right. Those are still problems. Um, but you can't, so if you're expecting a secrets management system to solve all of those problems, you're in trouble because it just gets so hard. So you have to say, okay, these are still problems, these are still part of the complexity. Now, in the place I have DNS spoofing and all those sorts of things aren't really a problem because they're controlled by somebody else. You can't set up your own DNS, you're not allowed, right? And there's a whole bunch of people wandering around making sure that's not happening. If you were trying to do it on the internet, it'd be a whole different thing. Right? And you might use DNSSEC or something like that. But it's, this feels really difficult to me because we've got to pass all these things up so that they're individually understandable as separate problems. But yeah, it's still part of the weakness and part of the attack factor. So you've got to think about it in a whole and you've got to think about these tiny things. It's very, very difficult. Okay, thank you ever so much. Good questions, thank you.